the creator of the universe. He's the one who gave us life. He's the one who gave us everything we have. When you commit a crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what should be the repayment for that? Can you and me judge what is the penalty? What is the compensation? What is the real harm that you have caused? Not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personally, but what is the nature and the magnity of the, of the crime? You know, we can't calculate that. We, have, we haven't got that knowledge to calculate. We don't know what the value of life itself is. Allah gave us life, every single one of us. We don't even know what the value of that is. He gave us eyesight. We don't know the value. He gave us this uh, gift of breathing, oxygen, air, right? The dunya, the, the sky, the mountains, water, all of these gifts he gave us, we cannot put a price on it. So when somebody commits a crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot calculate what the payment should be, what the punishment should be, what the compensation should be. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can give you what the right compensation, repayment or punishment should be. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He is just. He is just. He does not oppress or do an injustice of an atom's weight of injustice. He does not in do injustice to anybody. This is very important to understand when we talk about or when the Quran talks about the hellfire, punishment, forever in the hellfire. Some people say, what kind of a Lord is this? What kind of a God is this? Permanent punishment in the hellfire and not just any hellfire. This is, you know, they said that the fire of hell is so many more times, some, some narration says 70 times more hotter some say more. What kind of punishment is this? Day and night punishment in the hellfire and forever. That's because we're using our dunya calculation. We're thinking if somebody did that to me, okay, if he paid me this amount, afterwards I'll forgive him. No, but we cannot calculate the value of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every single individual. And we cannot calculate what the cost of that crime is to deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot calculate that. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give the true recompense for that, the true payment, the true value on that. So this is very important to understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 86, He begins with asking a question. كَيْفَ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا كَفَرُوا بَعْدَ إِمَانِهِمْ وَشَاهِدُوا أَنَّ الرَّسُولَ حَقٌّ أَنَّ الرَّسُولَ حَقٌّ وَجَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, how will Allah guide a people who chose to disbelieve after they have believed and acknowledge the messenger to be true and received clear proofs? وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ For Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a question here. We said last week, this is istifham uh, inkari. This is a rhetorical question um, that is censuring or blaming. Um, it's, it's, it's like saying, like, how, 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 how or why should Allah guide? Why would He guide a people? Right? Or how can he guide a people that who chose to disbelieve, not only disbelieve, they chose to disbelieve after they had believed. They had Iman, right? And they, they, they bore witness that this is, messenger is true. And they received, وَجَاءَهُمُ bayinat. They received clear signs, those came to, him, to them, either the miracles of the prophets, or the books from the Prophet's revelation. So this is talking about Ahlul Kitab, the previous nations. How will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them if they have already believed first, they bore witness, whichever messenger came to them, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, whichever messenger came to them, they bore witness to the truth that these are true messengers. 
But then when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to them, they they rejected him. They disbelieved in him. When the Quran came as a clear sign, as a clear proof, as a clear miracle, they rejected it. So how can Allah subhanahu wa taala guide these people? How can Allah subhanahu wa taala guide a people who choose after having faith to disbelieve? And it says Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Allah does not guide the zalimin. This is zulm. This is oppression. This is injustice. Because Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed to you the truth, and He mentioned in your books originally, and He mentioned on the tongue of your prophets originally, to follow any messenger that comes after them, to follow any books that come after them, as long as it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa taala with a clear proof. This is all it was. So Allah subhanahu wa taala censures them and blames them. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala says. أولئك جزاؤهم أن عليهم لعنة الله والملائكة والناس أجمعين. Their reward is that they will be condemned by Allah سبحانه وتعالى, the angels and all of humanity. So the entire cosmos is condemning those who knowingly receive the truth, have seen the truth, and then they choose voluntarily. Choose to disbelieve. This is such a crime against Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that Allah condemns them, the angels condemn them, and all of humanity condemns them. And we've been through these verses in Surah Al Baqarah as well. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala continues: خالدين فيها لا يخفف عنهم العذاب ولا هم ينظرون. They will be in the hellfire forever. Their punishment will not be lightened, nor will they be delayed from it. So this is explaining more in details that those who disbelieved, after having iman, after seeing the messengers, after seeing the proofs of Isa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and all the messengers in between and before and after, and then when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came, they rejected him, even though he came with the same proofs that Musa alayhi salam came with. He came with the same message. He came with the same message of Tawheed. He came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala with a mission, with a responsibility, and he he came to confirm everything they believed in, everything their books told them, apart from what they changed. He came to confirm that the truth of the previous messengers and books, but they still rejected him. This is a great crime against Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Hence, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala makes it clear that this is the punishment. خالدين فيها لا يخفف عنهم العذاب ولا هم ينظرون. They will be in the hellfire forever. Their punishment will not be lightened, nor will they be delayed from it. I nor will they be delayed from the punishment. So this is a severe, severe warning to to all of all of humanity, really, not just. People of the book, not just those who disbelieve, even even the believers. Although the khitab, the the address, what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is addressing, the people of the book or those who reject, those who disbelieve after the advent of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there's a lesson in there for believers as well. There's a lesson in there for believers. Aren't aren't believers also sometimes falling into the same trap? They know the truth of the Quran. They know the truth of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yet we still do not follow fully what Allah subhanahu wa taala commands us to do. Yet we do not follow fully what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded us to do. So there's a lesson. Yes, the 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 point of the verse, the audience for the verse are the people of the book, are the disbelievers who knowingly reject. But also we mustn't forget that the Quran always has lessons for. Believers as well within that message. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala then says, "Illa ladina tabu min baad dhalik wa aslahu fa inna Allah ghafur rahim." Subhanallah. As for those who repent afterwards and mend their way, except for those who repent afterwards and mend their ways, then surely Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Subhanallah. Even if somebody had iman and they fully believed in the previous messengers and the books, and then they disbelieved, 
with Muhammad and the Quran. But after that, they repented and uh, accepted Islam and surrendered. Allah is all forgiving. SubhanAllah. Allah is all forgiving. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the mercy of Allah. He's a Rahman, a Rahim. Whoever makes repentance, whoever does tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept no matter who they are, whatever their history, whatever their background, whatever their track record, whatever they did in the past, it doesn't matter. Allah is ready to accept the tawbah, the returning back of every single human being. This is an open door until death arrives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready and willing to accept tawbah of every single human being. This is for people who rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kufr, disbelief. What about believers? What about believers who have fallen into weakness and sin and made mistakes and committed some crimes, committed some sins? Allah is even more ready to accept their tawbah. So believers should never be in despair. We hear this often, oh Shaykh, or oh, brother, make dua for me. And you say to them, yes, of course, make dua for me as well. And they'll say, no, my duas, you know, we don't know if um, Allah will accept my duas and things like that. Because I'm not very pious, I'm not. No, you don't know whose dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept. Many times in the narrations, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you, you are sustained by the dua of your poor amongst you. You are sustained by the dua of the poor amongst you. You don't know whose tawbah, whose dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept. The fact is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua of anyone who is sincerely asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He even accepts the dua of non, non-Muslims. This is, this is accepted. He accepts the dua of non-Muslims in this dunya. Even non-Muslims who make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he accepts the dua. This is a fact. So the door of tawbah is open for everybody. Door of Tawbah is even more open for the believers. And of course the Prophet ﷺ, he encouraged us to do istighfar on a daily basis many times. Many, many times a day. To remember death, do istighfar. The Prophet ﷺ said, I do it more than 70 times a day. After every ibadah, when you wake up in the morning, before you go to bed, when you come out the house, etc, etc. So, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's open for everybody. Even after, even after such a crime as re- rebelling against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disbelieving, rejecting the truth, if they make sincere tawbah, Allah is ready to accept. And for the believers, of course, Allah is even more willing to accept the tawbah as long as it's sincere. So believers must always, this is very important, we must be constantly doing istighfar, Returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can. This is so important. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْدَ إِيمَانِهِمْ ثُمَّ ازْدَادُوا كُفْرًا لَنْ تُقْبَلَ تَوْبَتُهُمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الضَّالُّونَ So now there's a bit of a contrast. In the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ In the, pre, the, the verse just before that, Allah said, except for those who repent afterwards and mend their ways, then surely Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. And note here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, just tabu. He said, إِلَّا لَذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا So don't just make tawbah. But do islah of yourself, which means they mend their ways, they improve. Islah means to repair something, to improve something, to set something right after it was broken. So not just tawbah, but then fix whatever was wrong, fix whatever the weakness is, fix whatever the problem was. By, by stopping, stop doing that sin, improving yourself, become better. So, so after this verse, Allah says something quite different now. In this verse, verse 90, Allah is saying, indeed those who disbelieve, after having believed, then increase in their disbelief. Their repentance will never be accepted. It is they who are astray. This is frightening. This is frightening because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying, 
لن تقبل توبتهم لن means never the tawbah will never be accepted how is this because in the one hand we're saying tawbah is open for everybody until the last moment of their death before they die if they make tawbah Allah accepts it but here Allah is saying their tawbah will never be accepted what's going on here so firstly who, are, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about so here these people what do they do the first set of people they disbelieve they had iman first perhaps with the previous prophets or books then they disbelieved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned them except if they made tawbah and, and improved themselves illa ladhina tabu and aslahu those he accepted here this group of people are doing the same thing they're doing kufr ba'da imanihim but the difference here thumma zdadu kufra the difference here is these people are now they had iman then they rejected the truth and I'll come to who, who these people are they had iman they rejected the truth then they increased in their kufr they increased in rejection of the truth so the mufassirun they discussed who, who are these people that Allah will not accept their tawbah so some of them said it's pe people of the previous nations who were at, the, at Medina at the time, people of the book who had Iman but then they did kufr by changing the books or making Isa salam into ilah worshipping Isa salam that's kufr so inna ladhina kafaru ba'da imanihim they believed in Isa salam or believed in his book and his message and then they did kufr then thumma zdadu kufran when Muhammad وسلم, came with the message, they rejected him alayhi salam. So this is the increase, this is a, even more kufr. ثُمَّ ازْدَادُ كُفْرًا They rejected Muhammad وسلم, they rejected the Qur'an. So this is the increase in kufr. So this is one explanation that the Mufassirun have said. There's other discussions as well, um, but I think this one fits um, more kind of in, ter in terms of the context of the surah who, who the, uh, these verses are addressing, it fits that. Some of the Mufassirun, and it's true, all verses can be, even if it's specifically for a group of people, it can also be applied to more generally whoever fits that description. So it could be anybody who had faith, had Iman, then they left the deen. They, they, they become... Uh, deniers, rejectors of the deen, they become kafir and then they not only reject the deen they do even worse things you know, they, they make it a mission in their life to rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to condemn the deen to make the deen their life target of enmity and hatred it could, it could apply to these people as well so anything generally that fits under the description that could also be these people. But how do you explain لَن تُقْبَلَ تَوْبَتُهُمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الضَّالُّونَ How do you explain that their tawbah will never be accepted? What if these people make tawbah? Why wouldn't Allah accept their tawbah? What's the difference? So the explanation here is, here it means لَن تُقْبَلَ تَوْبَتُهُمْ doesn't mean literally what it says. It doesn't mean their tawbah won't be accepted. It's an expression in Arabic, meaning that they won't make tawbah. They won't make tawbah for their tawbah to be accepted. That's what it means, the expression in Arabic. It's, it's a certain style of expression, which means that they won't make tawbah. Because kufr is so ingrained in their hearts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the secrets of everybody's hearts. The kufr is so ingrained it's so deep, the hatred or rebellion has become so ingrained, so permeate, permeating the heart and, and their, their self that they won't make tawbah, they won't return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in other words, what this expression means, لَن تُقْبَلَ تَوْبَتُهُمْ 
is that there will be no tawbah to accept from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, Allah is saying these people will not make tawbah because they're so ingrained, so deep into their kufr. وَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الضَّالُونَ And it is they who are astray. So that's the explanation of that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارٌ فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمْ مِلْءُ الْأَرْضِ ذَهَبًا وَلَوْ افْتَدَى بِهِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first talked about those in this dunya, they have iman, then they reject, and then they make tawbah, or they have iman, then they reject, do kufr, and then increase in their kufr. Now this, this verse is talking about those who disbelieve and then die as disbelievers. Those who disbelieve and die as disbelievers. That means their life is finished and they seal their conclusion in disbelief. So there's no other chance for tawbah anyway. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed if each of those who disbelieve then die as disbelievers were to offer a ransom of enough gold to fill the whole world, it would never be accepted from them. It is they who will suffer a painful punishment and they will have no helpers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now describes the hereafter, what happens to these people. And look at what he's saying. It's too late after you die, before you die, the doors are open. After you die, even if you were to offer the whole world full up and filled up with gold, and it's just, again, it's just an expression. You can't fill up the whole world with gold. It just means no matter what you were to offer, even if it was more gold than the whole earth worth of gold, it would never be accepted as a ransom, as a payment to free yourself from the hellfire. It's not going to be accepted because that is the justice. As I said in the beginning, that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the magnitude of the crime of rebelling and rejecting the truth against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of rebelling and rejecting a messenger. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the true value and therefore the punishment is in accordance, commensurate to that knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can't think that, oh, that sounds really harsh, that sounds really, you know, no. We don't use our intellect above the wahi, above what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't have that knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear here that even if they were to offer in ransom to free themselves, everything in the world full of gold, it would not be accepted from them. It would never be accepted from them. And it is they who will suffer a painful punishment and they will have no helpers. <clears throat> then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so those are the verses dealing with those who reject Iman. After having Iman, after being shown the truth, after believing perhaps in pre previous messengers and books, and then rejecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst he is in front of them, whilst he brings the proof of the Qur'an, etc. And what would happen to them in the dunya, and what would happen to them in the akhirah. The next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the believers now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ you will never achieve righteousness until you donate some of what you cherish. And whatever you give is certainly well known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the connection all of a sudden now addressing the believers? The connection is the ransom. The previous verse, Allah said, if you were to donate an offer to the disbelievers, addressing the disbelievers, Allah said, if, you, if they were to offer the whole world full of gold, to rescue themselves from the hellfire and the punishment, Allah would not accept it. So now Allah is turning to the believers and telling you what Allah will accept as a, as a ransom, as a way of saving ourselves from the hellfire. That we have to spend from what we love. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy is turning to us and offering us a way out, pointing us, directing us. How can we save ourselves from the hellfire? How can we ransom ourselves? How can we save our necks from the hellfire? But there's, there's, there's some um, explanation here, of course. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never, لَن تَنَالُوا You will never achieve al-bir. Bir, they translate as righteousness, but in Arabic they say it's, it's al-khair kulluhu. It's all, everything which is good. All good, al-khair, includes good manners, charity, being good to your parents, um, helping others, salah, fasting, everything. Everything opposite of ithm, everything the opposite of sin, all good deeds, whatever they are, is, is, can come under the umbrella term al-birr. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, help each other in, in righteousness and taqwa. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And do not help each other, do not cooperate with each other in ithm, in sin, right? So, he, um, ithmi wal-udwan, in, in sin and, and rebellion or, or enmity, etc. So, he contrasts bir with ithm in this verse. He first says cooperate in bir and taqwa, and its opposite are ithm, and Udwan. So everything the opposite of ithm, opposite of sin, is included under bir. Bir is righteousness, is good deeds, is being kind to your family, your, 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 your brothers and sisters, is spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. But here, Allah says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Hatta means, they say it's for ghaya. It's, it's the end of something. So you will not achieve al-bir, you will not achieve the, the rank of, of someone who has bir, who is righteous, until you, know, until you reach that point, until you go and reach a certain point. What is that point? That point is, hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. So that point is, when you spend from that which you love, not just any spending. Sometimes, you know, in the masjid, you got loose change Friday in the bucket. That's not something you love. Few, few pounds, 50 pence, few, few, few coppers. That's not something you love, usually. Until you spend from that which you love. When this ayah was revealed, uh, I forgot the sahaba's name, I think it was Abu Talha. He came up to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, My most beloved possession is, is a well which was in front of or opposite of Masjid Nabawi. He said, this is my most beloved possession. It was a well where they get, draw water from and it was just opposite of the Masjid. And it's a well that the Prophet ﷺ used to go and rest near sometimes and drink water from. So of course, this is a beloved piece of land, a beloved well of the Sahabi. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, this is my most beloved possession. I give it, donate it, fi sabilillah. I donate, donate it for the sake of Allah. Tell me, what should I do? Who should I give it? He said, I give it. Prophet ﷺ, he congratulated him. But before that, the Sahabi said, you do as you please with it. I've given it for the sake of Allah, you do as you please with it. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him glad tidings that your transaction has been successful. So this is what this ayah is talking about. It's talking about something that is beloved, dear to you. Right? Until it, and it means there's levels and there's a path. There's lots of good things you must do to reach there. So you have to do many good things. Yeah, there's many duties upon us, whether it's our obligations towards our family, towards our brothers and sisters, towards our colleagues, right? Towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You keep on doing these things until you reach that level of spending from that which you love. Meaning, it's not just you will jump to that level 
and that's it, Allah is going to accept you. No, there's lots of things along the way. You will do many good deeds, but you won't reach al-bir until you do this thing. Until you are able to take the most beloved thing in your possession, or, and it, Allah didn't say, حَتَّى uh, تُنْفِقُوا مَا تُحِبُّونَ He said, حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Subhanallah, it's a rahma. He said, until you spend from min lil tab'id. They said, until you spend a portion from that which you love. You don't have to give everything. The Sahabi gave the whole well. He could have said, you know, I, I, I give three days of its water to charity or something like that. So Allah is not asking for you to donate everything. But just donate from that is which, which is most beloved to you. Donate a portion of it, some of it. And they said that it will differ from person to person. What is going to be the most beloved thing to a person? It's going to differ with every single different person. For some people, they love jewelry. Some people love money, cash. Some people love their property. Some people love their cars. Whatever it is, everyone's got different things that they love in terms of material possession. And usually, in fact, is used for um, money, clothing, or food. These are the three things in those days when they said in fact, um, they generally understood that. But it, it includes other things as well. It can include anything. But it's got to be from that which you love. And that's a decision or that's a thing that will change person to person. Whatever it is, think about it. What is your most beloved thing? For somebody it might be money. For somebody it could be something else. It could be some other thing. From that, see if you can donate. See if you can give that. If you can, and whilst doing everything else, then you reach that position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, you, when you donate it, you're only benefiting yourself. You're donating it to yourself. In, in reality, you're donating it not to give it away. You're just storing it up for yourself. That's why Allah said, وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ Whatever you donate, right? مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever it is, however small it is, it is certainly well known to Allah. Means Allah is not going to forget that. He, he sees what you donate. He will store that for you. And He will increase it on the Day of Judgment. He will increase it in the Akhirah. So it's not, there's no loss at all. Allah is going to give you that back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whilst contra look at the contrast between those who reject, rebel, and do kufr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing is accepted from them. On the day of judgment, it's too late. There's nothing's going to be accepted. Even if they were to give the whole world full of gold, it will not be accepted. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrasts that with how Allah's mercy and love is with the believers. He's showing us what will reach you to that rank of bir. He's showing us that if you spend from that which you love, that will get you to that rank. And that will free you, inshallah, on the day of judgment. And the Prophet sallallahu said in a hadith that al-bir is husnul khuluq. He said al-bir is husnul khuluq. So in different hadith, different ayahs, you will find explanations of what is bir. In, uh, so here he said, it's good character. Al-bir is good character. So even our, how we deal with one another, how we behave, how we carry ourselves, this is also bir. There's nothing heavier on the scale of, on the day, day of judgment, as, Allah, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ said, said then, then good character. And sometimes we overlook these things. We think most important is, you know, the, the, the usual things that we know of the deen. That's the most important. Who does more salah? Who does more fasting? Who's done how many hajj? Those, of course, are important. And we overlook the, the character. The Prophet ﷺ said, I've only been sent to perfect the noble qualities of character. He's been, only to send, he's been only sent to perfect the noble qualities of character. So adab and character, how we deal with it, other people. This is bir as well. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse that, you know, bir is belief in Allah, in his messengers, on the day, uh, day of judgment, etc. And he continues, and treating your relatives well, and treating the stranger uh, and the orphans. So bir covers so many different things. But here, Allah is pointing to a specific level that if you can reach that level by spending from that which you love, then inshallah you would have attained that, that rank of being someone of bir, someone who is righteous. So we'll stop here inshallah today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to uh, really um, direct our lives with, with, the, with, with the hereafter in mind. You can only spend from that which you love if we direct our lives towards the hereafter. If we have that full belief that this world is temporary. Everything I possess, I could lose tomorrow. I could lose my life tomorrow. Even tonight, I may, may not be here. Once you realize the temporary nature of this world, then you can spend. It's easy to spend. It's so easy to spend. Once you, once you realize that. It's not easy to realize that. It's not easy to put that in our hearts. But it takes practice. Spend a little bit. Build a habit. Read the Quran. Read how the Sahabas, how they sacrificed. You know how Abu Bakr radiallahu and Umar radiallahu, how they competed with each other and were willing to sacrifice everything. So read those things. Those things will inspire us, motivate us, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to um, take lesson from his ayahs and, and implement them in our lives. Jazakumullah khairan. We'll stop here today, inshallah. Um, if there are any questions, we can take, inshallah. No questions today? Okay, inshallah. Jazakum khairan. If there's any new brothers here, um, Brother Khairo, is he here? Yeah, okay. Um, you can contact Brother Khairo. We have a WhatsApp group. We just put out all the uh, links for the recordings of the sessions. And we make the announcements of timings and things like that. Sometimes the timing changes from Asr after Maghrib, depending on which month. Um, so yeah, you can contact Brother Khairo and leave your number with him, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing? You okay? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, go on. You know when you read the book, and then when you do such a voice, is that all right? Yeah, just move the, um, move the, whatever's on your head, whether it's the hair or something, just move, move it above so that a portion of the head has to be done. It has to, it has to be done. It but if it's, if nothing, if it's nothing, yeah, that's not something of the whole nature. Yeah. How's it going? Good. Are you studying anywhere? It's not? I'm in college, but I'm also, yeah. I'm in Sabi. Sabi, what course are you doing? The first one. Okay. What uh, level? Is it different? Um, is it foundation level? Or yeah, I'm in my first year. First year? Okay, okay. How many years is the course? Three. Three years. And then we went to different.